Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First ARP Lancaster. We're glad you're here. Uh, welcome visitors. I think we have a couple of visitors here with us today. And it's uh, going to be a warm Sunday afternoon, so just sit back and relax. <laughs> we have uh, one announcement. Wednesday night, Mark. I've forgotten his name. Uh, Mark, Mark Whitty is going to be here, and there's a dinner going on, and I think you need to sign up. I assume that you can still sign up today. Uh, uh, so, uh, so remember to do that if you get a chance. And the uh, today is a pleasure to welcome our Speaker, our minister, Mr. Greg Delaney, he's from Chester. He tells me he's been in Chester his whole life when he wasn't busy doing other things. And he is an elder at Chester ARP Church, and he will be ordained by the end of this month and be a reverend. And so today he will not be able to say the, uh, the uh, close us out, but, but he soon will be. So let's welcome Mr. Delaney now. Good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. I appreciate uh, Kyle set this up before he left. Um, I think he's got me coming back one more time. But um, I'm from Chester. I'm from Chester. Uh, was born in Chester. I wasn't raised there. I was raised in Camden. My father moved away. We, we worked at DuPont. Uh, but I've been in Chester since I uh, graduated from Citadel, graduated from law school. And I was in the South Carolina house for 27 years. And then I went to Erskine Seminary and graduated in uh, 22. And uh, here I am. But in any event, Kyle's a great guy and I appreciate him and I appreciate the, the session for allowing <coughs> me to be here today. Um, first we'll have our, our call to worship I will extol to you my God and King and bless your name forever and ever every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever great is the Lord greatly to be praised and great his greatness is unsearchable if you would turn in your red hymnals uh, to uh, number 561 Lord speak to me that I may speak
If you would pray with me. Our God and our Father, we thank you for life. We thank you for life eternal. Great are you, our Lord, greatly be praised. Great is your power and your wisdom. There is no end. Father, we are poor, undeserving, sinful people, have sinned greatly in your sight. We seek your forgiveness. We ask for grace to enable us to please you. We ask for mercy when we fail. We ask for the peace which can only be found by resting in your steadfast love. Father, we ask you to accept this day our, the reading and the preaching of your holy word. And we ask these things for Jesus' sake and in his name. Amen. We have our assurance of pardon. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us, as it is written. Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that Jesus Christ, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles, so we might receive the promised spirit through faith. If you would, we'll state the Apostles' Creed. Um, you know, the Apostles' Creed is a... Uh, is one of my my uh, favorite things that we we have. Um, the Apostles' Creed was originally uh, done for baptism. They were back in the early church, the very early church. It was not written down. You know, the rest of our creeds came from uh, church councils, but the Apostles' Creed came by word of mouth at baptism. Uh, the early church would have baptism at Easter time, and they would say. Uh, uh, Believer, what do you believe? And the person would state the Apostles' Creed. So I ask you, believer, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the wick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Okay, now we'll, you may be seated. Because I know you don't uh, take up collection, but you do have places provided to, to put the collection, and we'll have our offertory prayer, prayer of thanksgiving. If you would pray with me. Our God and our Father, we know that everything on earth and in heaven is yours, belonging to you and to you alone. Yet you have greatly blessed us with your provision. We ask you this day to accept from us a portion of that which you have provided to us and use it for the establishment of your kingdom and for your glory. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Grace in the Blue Psalter, uh, 119.
may be seated. If you would pray with me, we'll have a prayer for our needs. Our God and our Father, we are people in need. There are some who need healing, both physical and spiritual, and others that need other provision. Father, we know that you know what our needs are, and we ask you to grant those needs in accordance with your will and purpose for our lives. Father, we also lift up our community, our state, and our nation. Father, you know we live in dark times. There are times that we could not even imagine just a few short years ago. We pray for our leaders, Father. We pray for our president. We pray for our Congress, our senators, our representatives. Father, we pray for our state, we pray for our governor, we pray for the General Assembly, the House and the Senate. We pray for our courts, we pray for our United States Supreme Court, we pray for our state courts. We pray for our leaders, Father, because you have commanded us to do that. And we ask that they seek you in all that they do. Father, we ask you to give us leaders who honor you and remove those who dishonor you. Father, we pray that you will bring revival to our country, and we pray that that revival will begin with us here today. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, the name before which one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. All right, well, I, like I said, I appreciate y'all having me here today. Um, I've known Kyle a long time. He's a friend of mine. Um, I love to go to Presbytery when Kyle, when Kyle and Clint and uh, Mark from over at, over at Clover and uh, James uh, down in Winsboro, uh, they just make Presbytery a, a fun thing. Uh, they're always shooting at one another. But, uh, but they're all good friends, and I, I love them all. They're just really fine people. Uh, when Kyle asked me to come here today, I didn't realize that it was uh, Father's Day when he told me that, and I prepared this message, and uh, it's on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. And at first I thought I ought to change that, but the more I thought about it, uh, who better than fathers need to be reminded about what Christian love is, fathers who are supposed to lead the Christian home. And of course, all of us need to be reminded about Christian love, what Christian love is. You know, 1 Corinthians is one of the best known chapters, um, or 1 Corinthians 13 is one of the best known chapters in the Bible. You know, we often see verses from 1 Corinthians 13 printed on all manner of things in stores. Uh, we hear it read at weddings and on other occasions where it is often taken out of biblical context. 1 Corinthians 13, to many, is thought to be a very warm, comfortable passage. But a study of this passage reveals it's a challenging passage. These verses uh, teach us by showing us actions and attitudes that should become habits in our lives if we are to exhibit Christ-like love. God gives us the grace to enable us to exhibit Christian love. But Christian love is not something 
It comes natural to us. It takes work. It takes a study of the scripture. It takes being bathed in prayer. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love is contrary to our fallen nature. And it requires an exercise of, of the will in obedience to God's commands. To put 1 Corinthians uh, in historical context, Paul was writing to the church at Corinth. Paul is credited with planning the church at Corinth. It was composed of both Jews and Gentiles, as all the churches were that he planted. Uh, Paul usually started his evangelism in a synagogue until he was thrown out of the synagogue. Then he went to the Gentiles. And you, we remember that Corinth was a very wicked place. It was a pagan city and known to be a very wicked place. During Paul's time, if someone referred to you as being Corinthianized, it meant that you were immoral, you be, had become an immoral person. So the Gentiles and the Jews at Corinth came from very different cultures and different religions with vastly different worship practices. Of course, you can imagine these Gentiles grew up worshiping, worshiping false gods in these pagan temples. They had immoral uh, worship practices. Uh, you might imagine the baggage they brought to the church at Corinth. And then, of course, the Jews uh, came from Judaism, uh, and they brought their own baggage. But God, through the work of the Holy Spirit, can bring disparate people together in Christ. You know, I'm always gratified at, at uh, Presbytery when I hear testimonies by students in theology where uh, one might get up and say they came to Christ as a child at an early age. That's really gratifying to me because I know that they bring far less baggage to deal with than those of us who came to Christ later in life. But Paul is writing to, the, to a church that had experienced a great revival and among the Jews and the Gentiles. And, and it had grown, had, it, it had experienced growth and success, but in the process, many in the church, many of the church leaders had lost sight of what really matters to God. And that's what Paul was writing his letter about. As a result, the church was suffering from division and confusion. As we study this morning, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I'd like us to think about three points. Number one, what is love? Number two, what kind of love was Paul speaking of? And number three, what did Paul mean in the last verse of chapter 13, verse 13, when he said, as between faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. If you would, read with me 1 Corinthians Chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been known 
fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. If you would, pray with me. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit to work among us. Father, bless us in the reading, the hearing, and the preaching of your holy word. Provide conviction where conviction is needed, and assurance where assurance is needed. Father, empower our service to you. Change our flaws. Forgive our sins. Father, you know what they are, and we know what they are. In the words of the Puritan prayer, Father, what we know not teach us, what we have not give us, what we are not make us, for the sake of your Son, we offer this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. And you know, I've already messed up. We did not uh, say the Lord's Prayer. Let's end this prayer by saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, so the first point. What is love? Well, first of all, can anyone define what love is? I must confess that I don't have the vocabulary or the understanding to adequately define love in the English language. All I know is what the scripture says. In John 4, 8, it says, God is love. And I know that love is a mystery of God, that love comes from God, that love is a, is a gift of God, that love is a mystery that's partially unveiled to us, perhaps as image bearers, is part of the image of God that mankind possesses because we were made in his image. But I can't put into words what love is, but I know what love does. Love is an enabler. It enables us to commit. And I know it when I experience it, and I know it when I see it. Second point, what kind of love is Paul speaking of in 1 Corinthians 13? Paul is writing to us about what I'm going to refer to as Christian love. A love that proceeds from the nature of God rather than being based on the merit of the beloved, us, sinners. It's not based on what we do. It's not based on what we might do or what we will do. Alistair Begg, who is one of my favorite ministers, he's Scottish, and he's a friend of uh, Sinclair Ferguson, who was once a senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, and they write books together oftentimes. Alistair Begg refers to Sinclair Ferguson as his older brother. They're both Scottish. Uh, but he points out that in terms of human relationships with the opposite sex, we tend to be attracted and love depending on what we see as lovely in the other person. And if we find what we found as lovely wanes, our love may wane. The trouble with the Corinthian church was they were using or employing a similar type of love with fellow Christians. They were valuing their, their fellow believers based on their gifts, based on what they could do for them, based on who they were based on what they could do for their purposes, not for God's will and purpose. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love described there is a love that transcends our circumstances. It's something that's greater, than more important than self. I remember uh, back when I was a deacon, probably about 30 years ago, uh, it was decided that the deacons would cut this lady's grass um, who, an older lady, went to our church. She had children. They didn't live in Chester. 
And uh, she lived in a very nice house, had a very nice lot. Uh, but it was decided that we would cut her grass. And that was back in the days before very many people had riding lawnmowers. Everybody had push lawnmowers. So we loaded up all the push lawnmowers when they were cutting her grass. And I was thinking to myself, I don't even cut my own grass. You know, I have to pay somebody to do that. And, uh, and it was really kind of aggravating for me to be cutting grass. But then I, later I came to, to see, see it differently. I remember one time we were washing walls as deacons in the church at Chester in the Barron Room. And we were washing those walls, and I was washing those walls, and it was just such miserable work. And then I started thinking about it, and I said, you know, I'm really not doing this for the church. You know, I wasn't cutting grass for that lady. I was doing that for the Lord. And that's the way we need to look at our everyday lives, and everything we should do, we should do for him, and do as well as we can for him. It's like the love that Jesus manifested on the cross for us. You know, God, you know, God sent his own son to be something. He became something that he had never been before. And that was a man. He was fully man and he was fully God. He had always been. There had never been a time when there wasn't the son, the third person in the Trinity, or the second person in the Trinity. And um, he became a man. Uh, he was born of Mary. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost, which made him divine and God. He wasn't conceived in an ordinary way. But he was born of Mary, born of her substance. He was fully man. And in his human nature, he died for us. He didn't, he didn't die in his divine nature. He died in his human nature. He walked this earth. He suffered and was tempted. And, but he was, unlike us, he was a, without sin. But God gave us his son. God loves us even though we stumble in sin and disappoint him and prove to be totally unworthy of his love. But nevertheless, he loves us. Paul says we should love other believers like God loves us, like Christ loves us. And you can imagine those newly converted uh, Jews who had... Uh, been raised under Judaism their entire life, and then they're put together by the work of the Holy Spirit with these newly converted Gentiles. You can imagine that they had some, some issues. But Jesus loved us, and we are to love other believers like he loves us. And to just to see how challenging 1 Corinthians 13 is, I want you to replace the word love with Jesus. And we read in verse 4, starting in verse 4, uh, Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus does not envy or boast. Jesus is not arrogant or rude. Jesus does not insist on his own way. It's not irritable or resentful. Jesus does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Doing, but rejoices at the truth with the truth. You know, if you just replace Jesus' name, it kind of explains to you what 1 Corinthians love is all about. But then replace place your own name in a place of love. Or place uh, First ARP Church of Lancaster in a place of love. First ARP Church of Lancaster is patient and kind, does not envy or boast, is not arrogant or rude. You know, are we living up? The question is, does that describe us as individuals? And do, does that describe our church? If it doesn't, the scripture says we have work to do if we are to evidence the love of Christ, of Christian love. In John 13, 34, Jesus says, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This passage reminds me of the study of early church history in the time of Emperor Constantine, who was said to have a religious conversion experience. 
but he issued a decree that ended government sanctioned persecution of the Christians in the Roman Empire. And it didn't end all persecution of Christians in the empire because the government was not the source of all the persecution, but it was a large source of the persecution. And one of the reasons credited for the change of heart in the treatment of Christians was the Christians' treatment of orphans, orphans, children who had been disowned by their mothers and fathers and often left to die perhaps because of a disability, but perhaps because of they were uh, of the wrong sex. Whatever the reason, they would leave these children just out to die, and Christians would take these children and raise them in Christian orphanages. And the Roman Empire saw that, and it began, began to be a change of heart about the Christian. John Stott, who was an Anglican theologian, said, the love described in 1 Corinthians 13 is a servant of our will, not a victim of our emotion. A servant of our will, not a victim of our emotion. Chapter 13, love, Christian love, is not falling in love with, fall, with strong feelings of attraction or affection. Otherwise, how could Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5, love your enemies? How can we love our enemies without an act of will to love in obedience to God's command? God gives us grace that enables us to do what would otherwise be impossible. You know, I had a problem with someone one time who we, I had frequent contact with that were just aggravating. And uh, sometimes I would argue with that person. And I prayed about it, and I asked God to help me deal with that person. And he gave me the grace not to argue anymore. I didn't have the desire to argue with him anymore. I just did whatever I needed to do, and we got along much better and had a much better relationship. But God will give us grace when we ask him to deal with life, to deal with sin in our lives to deal with problems in our lives. He'll give us the grace if we ask him to deal with those things. But Paul is not writing about uh, a, a love based on affection or personal attraction, but rather he is writing about the habitual exercise of a spiritual discipline, a willful, purposeful action and attitude that becomes habit in our lives. That becomes what we are known for if we exercise Christian love. It transcends our circumstances. We exhibit Christian love when we are committed to God because we love him and we want to obey him and we want to carry out his commands. The foundation of spiritual discipline of this Christian love is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit which comes through, as Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, by being born again. Or, as Paul says in Titus chapter 3, by regeneration. As the Westminster Confession says, it is the renewing of our wills so that we can realize a commitment to God by his grace enabling us to die more and more into sin and to live more and more unto righteousness. You know, we don't get there in this fallen world, but we will get there when we leave this world. Absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. When we get, when our souls get to heaven, when we are glorified, when we're, like, we're made like Christ, when we don't, when we can't sin, we made holy and perfect like Christ. But the evidence of our commitment to God is evidenced by our love for him. And our love for him is evidenced by our commitment to him. Commitment to God and commitment to those who God expects us to be committed, regardless of the circumstances, and whether they are worthy in our eyes or whether they benefit our purposes. And why? Because we are to love as God loves. Christian love is directed outward and away from ourselves. God the Father loved us so much, while we were yet sinners, he sent his Son the second person of the Trinity, 
to become a man, to live as one of us, yet without sin, and to die in our place, to pay our sin debt, the wages of sin is death, to suffer and die for our sins on the cross. God did this, as Romans says, while we were yet sinners. This kind of love is basic for the human, for the Christian character and essential for the church. And at the Corinthian church, there was a lack of this type of love. And the antidote or cure for the division and confusion in the church at Corinth was the love described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul says, regardless of the spiritual gift you may possess, regardless of who, may, who may, might admire, admire your gift, or how well you may exercise your gift, if you don't exercise your gift through 1 Corinthians chapter 13 love, you don't have anything. It's valueless to the will and purposes of God. The church in Corinth had many who were feeling superior because they were valuing one another by their gifts, putting others down, making them feel inferior. But Paul is telling the people, God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things through his Holy Spirit. Think back in the Old Testament to Moses, to Joshua, to Joseph, to Jeremiah, to Gideon, to David, and others. God told them, I will be with you. He anointed them and empowered them with the Holy Spirit, which allowed them to do great things for God's will and purpose. In Matthew 28, the Great Commission, Jesus tells us, as New Testament, New Covenant believers, he will be with us always to the end of the age. Unlike in the Old Testament, God doesn't temporarily anoint us to perform a specific task or position. The promise of the New Testament and the promise of the New Covenant that Jesus accomplished for us. Once we are born again or regenerated, God's Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us permanently. And Jesus promises he will always be with us, always until the end of the age. Paul tells the Corinthian church, without love, they are a noisy nuisance. Without exercising their spiritual gifts through love, their spiritual gifts are useless, valueless to God's will and purpose. That they should not value one another based on their spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul describes the church like a human body with all the parts being important. As the body can't function properly without all of its parts doing their job, Neither can the church. In the body of the church, there are many different gifts. Some have gifts as ministers, teachers, musicians, cleaners and maintainers of the church property. Some have the gifts of prayer and encouragement. All of these gifts are important. Christian love is transformative. It builds up God's people, magnifies Christ's presence, in our lives and in the life of the church. Paul says gifts without love equal chaos in the church. Paul uses a hyperbole saying even if he could speak the tongues of man, meaning all the languages known to man, uh, even, if the, even if he could speak in the languages used by angels, or even if he had the gift of prophecy that allowed him all under, great understanding, or if he had great faith that would allow him to move mountains, or if he sold all he had and gave it to the poor, or even if he became a martyr, if his motive was not Christian love, if it was not commitment to God the Father, Paul says, I gain nothing. Without Christian love, we are not significant or useful before a watching world or a sovereign God. Paul says the test God applies to our personal efforts in ministry is the motivation of the heart. In 1 Samuel, God says to, be, to obey is better than sacrifice. If we fail to use our gifts for the motivation of love for God, love for our fellow believers, those gifts are useless and amount to nothing. You can be well-spoken 
than a persuasive speaker or a talented musician. But if you don't have love, if your motivation for using those gifts is not Christian love and to obey and to glorify God, they are worth nothing. Lastly, Paul says in verse 13, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Why does Paul say that? Paul is saying there's something more important than spiritual gifts. The gifts that are of the Spirit that are used, in the, are used in the here and now. But love goes on forever, in eternity, from everlasting to everlasting. Gifts we have on this earth are for now, and they will pass away when we leave this fallen world. Gifts are temporary. Faith and hope are a means to an end, which is love. And love lasts forever, through all eternity. 1 Corinthians 13 answers the question, what is a Christian? A Christian is a person whose faith is in Christ alone, trusting in Christ alone for not only now, but for all eternity. Love is not a warm feeling of affection, but rather a genuine love for God and for fellow Christians. Hope is the assurance of everlasting life with Christ. Unless the Holy Spirit is at work in a person's heart, they can't have assurance of heaven. The natural man cannot know absolute certain assurance that heaven is my home. The genuine marks of a Christian are faith, hope, and love. If your personal trust and faith is in Jesus Christ and in him alone, if God has given you a genuine love for those who love Jesus, and if you have a heart, in your heart, a certain hope and assurance that heaven is your home, these are the identifying marks of belonging to Christ. That is the evidence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at work in your life. So, the last question, why is love the greatest of thee, of thee, of the three, faith, hope, and love? Does God have faith? No. The scripture doesn't say so. And why? God is sovereign. He doesn't need faith. Does God have hope? No. The scripture doesn't say so. And why doesn't God have hope? God is sovereign. He doesn't need hope. God is God. The Holy Spirit working in us is our source of faith and hope. Can God love? Yes, God is love. And when God is at work in our lives, others can see faith, hope, and love in us. And only one of the three goes with us to eternity. That is love. When we are glorified in heaven, faith and hope will be obsolete. The greatest thing that others can see in us is love something that resembles God's character and God's nature. The question is, do you have the identifying marks of salvation in Christ, of faith and trust in Christ alone for life and for eternal life? Do you have that certain hope that you will spend eternity with Christ? Do you love God and love those who love Christ and are you committed to him and those who love Christ if not the scripture says today is a day of salvation and Jesus stands at the door and knocks and my prayer for you is if you have not previously done so and if you sense the work of the Holy Spirit that you will respond to him today in Christ and believe in him and give your life to him today would you pray with me our God and our Father, Father, we ask you to bless the reading and the hearing and the preaching of your word. Father, if there's anyone here today who does not know you in a saving way, we pray that you would call them, that your Holy Spirit would convict them of their sin and show them a need for salvation, which is only found 
by your grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, our closing hymn will be the red uh, Trinity hymnal, number 597. Speak though I may speak with bravest fire. You know, the associate in our denomination's name <clears throat> means the free offer of the gospel. And so I tell you today that if you have heard the word read and you've read the word, you've heard the word, and you feel the drawing of the Holy Spirit in your heart, I ask you to turn your life over to him today. If you have any doubt, any wonder about that, ask me or ask one of the elders. We'd be glad to pray with you and help you. Our closing prayers from Numbers uh, 6, 24 through 26. Lord, bless you and keep you. The Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Mm -hmm.